Okay, so um, today's webinar training is called Growth Hacking Your Decision Making and how this came about is um, we are in the process of launching a new business in the new year, uh, a new seven figure business and we try and you know get in the best experts that we can to help us grow the business. So I came across um, Dawna actually on LinkedIn and we had a few conversations and um, she was uh, telling me about the uh, decision making systems that she uses um, for most of her corporate clients in America. So this was really intriguing for me and interesting. We got her on a call uh, with my partners and we decided to take her on as a consultant and obviously she's now helping us with our own business putting together some uh, really good systems um, for internal decision making. And something that really intrigued me and something that really um, why I thought it would be great to get uh, Dawn on to a webinar was um, she is uh, actually now the chosen author for um, a decision, decision making for dummies which is uh, uh, as you know one of a very one of the most popular books in the world on uh, teaching uh, people in uh, basically in basic terms how to learn any sort of subject so I thought wow this is interesting you know the, the books being launched soon so I wanted to get her on to a webinar straight away and um, uh, take us through some uh, growth hacking uh, that you can be making in decision making, especially for 2015. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dawna. Let's get Dawna on. Hi, Dawna. Hey, how are you? I'm great. Uh, first of all, thank you for... Um, yeah, thank, thank you for, thank you for uh, giving us the time today to come on to the webinar. And uh, I know you're going to be sharing some really, really cool things with us, so I'll, I'll let you get started. I'm going to just pass on um, the uh, controls to you. If you can see on your screen, it'll say... Um, oh, yes. Okay, brilliant. And if you click that, then it'll just show your screen, and then you can um, go ahead with your training um, presentation that you have. Brilliant. All yours. Fabulous. Thank you. Oh, so you can see the title slide, no problem? Got it. Yeah, brilliant. And guys, if it, if, and guys, if you've got any questions for Donna, please put them in during the presentation, during the training, and uh, we'll do a little Q and at the end of the uh, the training as well. So thank you very much. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Donna Jones. I'm a pre I'll change and leadership skill programs to build inner resilience in people. I've handled cooperative management approaches, multi-party decision making. But after noticing the world was changing faster than business thinking, I decided to make a new mission, and that's to raise the consciousness of business so it can lead, do better things for the world and, and lead with some ethical integrity. So now uh, the work involves co-creating workplaces that bring out the highest level of performance, creativity, and fulfillment that we can possibly imagine. And since 75% of people don't believe they're living up to their creative potential, companies have got a lot of room to grow. So by the end of this program, I hope you'll leave with some insights and tools you can use right away, immediately. As Sohal mentioned, I'm also the author of Decision Making for Dummies. It is, uh, now has seven five-star reviews on Amazon.com, which is, a, I have to say, a pretty nice feeling. It's uh, a resource handbook for decision making the 21st century. program, assuming you're still in line with this, you'll get a, a decision-making decision checklist, kind of like a cheat sheet, if you will. I'm going to start with a story. When I was uh, seven or so, I'd visit my aunt and uncle near Regina, Saskatchewan in Canada, where they grew wheat used to make the flour and bread you buy for sandwiches. The shelves in the living room of their farmhouse were covered in trophies from plowing competitions. There wasn't a neighbor for miles, yet they knew everyone because you relied on one another for a community. My Uncle Jack would set me up in the front seat of his truck, which looked a lot like this one, on top of some cushions, and I, I'd drive his truck down the driveway, hands-free, like I was probably seven years old, couldn't see over the top of the steering wheel. The truck steered itself. It was just like magic. And I, I, I suspected there was something special about that truck. Three years later, I realized I wasn't driving the truck at all. The steering was controlled because the tires were stuck in the deep ruts in the road, which was a, a mix of a massive rainstorm, deep mud, and then some sun that dried everything out. But until that moment, until that aha moment, I really believed that somehow when I was behind the wheel of that particular truck, I could stay on the road without any effort 
without thinking or paying much attention. Decision making works pretty much the same way. Decision making can get stuck in the ruts in our minds. So decision making habits can create a certain comfort zone. You can think of it as hands free automatic driving. Your brain naturally looks for patterns that help you predict what will happen next. These patterns tell the brain what to expect. And your brain stores what's worked in the past and then brings it forward when you have to make a snap decision. So patterns can serve us as decision makers in many different ways. They help provide some degree of predictability and can provide insights once the patterns of decision making can leave you really vulnerable when conditions change. When con conditions change, habits obviously have to change too, and, and that has a direct impact on how you make your decisions. So sometimes you're aware of that change. It's in your face. For instance, when you start your own business, when you're changing direction in an existing business, or when you've accepted a new job with increased responsibility or accountability. So big steps like that drive you straight into new, unfamiliar territory. And you navigate by keeping one eye open, paying attention to what's going on around you and how it's influencing what you focus on and how you feel. Have you ever lost your job? had a financial meltdown, had a marital meltdown, had things not go according to expectations or plans, had your business fail or your career interrupted. Just like that, open the space to reinvent your life or your business anew. You're presented with an opening to rethink everything. Sure, you might spend a certain amount of time in a period of chaos, but chaos is a blank canvas for fresh original ideas to emerge if you let them so that they disrupt things that are no longer working for you. Now conditions are constantly changing and globally there's a lot of unknowns about the larger ecological implications associated with the effects of climate change. Socially as well there's an emerging new generational set of values which, which is powering these innovative startups that are really quietly disrupting old ways of doing business. And it doesn't help that business schools have been teaching decision making as assuming that 80% of, of uh, life is predictable and 20% is uncertain. It's the exact opposite in real life. 80% is unpredictable and 20% is running an existing business. Hacking your decision making is key to your continued success. So now, what do I mean by hacking? Well, hacking is really about examining what you do and why you do it by applying uh, your ingenuity, by coming up with completely different approaches, and by applying creativity, shifting your perspective to create or invent a new design. So it's expanding your self-awareness so you can see what's influencing your decisions that you wouldn't otherwise notice. Because without that, you can't pivot or adjust to new information or to what you see ahead. So I've come up with some, something I call a tweet away, which is like partway between a tweet and a takeaway. I thought it was a very clever invention. The first one is question everything you take for granted or that seems obvious. Questions like, why don't sheep shrink in the rain? This question was posed by... sense of curiosity that says, I know nothing. <laughs> and when you come from that place, you can stay open and you can really learn. And when you do, you'll discover what assumptions you've been making, uh, and you'll see opportunities to do things differently that you wouldn't otherwise see. So how many of you have noticed that our planet and everything living on it is under pressure, including you and me? There's some big challenges in front of us, clean water, air, loss of biodiversity, feeding 7.5 billion people and growing, climate change. It's not a pressure on the top of your mind, but it's there nevertheless. And approach the right way, these challenges are really just huge opportunities that can be only realized when you really adapt your mindset and your decision making along with it. So one way to adapt is to boldly tread beyond your existing skill set 
to liberate some creative capacity lying within you and your company. You'll retain control event, which are definitely not that pleasant. Humans, though, often prefer to wait for a crisis to force themselves to adapt. And many companies have reinvented themselves through crisis. Companies like Toyota and Herman Miller, for example. But more have failed. Crisis is optional. You always have a choice. You always have an alternative. Neil deGrasse Tyson, host of the TV show Cosmos, said it really well. He, he said that being able to adapt our behavior to challenges is a good definition of intelligence. To use our intelligence to a distinct advantage and to allow us all to prosper. He also pointed out that there's a disconnect between what we know and what we do. Have you ever asked yourself, why am I here? What's the point and purpose? Whether you're running a business or running your life, having a sense of purpose is like being on a mission. material goods. It fulfills an innate yearning to be a part of something bigger than you, to really contribute. It's one of the core determinants of health. So the question you're, you, you'll ask yourself is, how can I serve the world I care about? After James Cameron, producer and director of Titanic and Avatar, saw Star Wars, he quit his job as a truck driver to enter the film industry, which I find remarkable. Imagine if he had never quit his job as a truck driver to enter into a business he had uh, absolutely no experience with whatsoever. So companies that run by people who follow their passion and are guided by a sense of personal intent or purpose do exceptionally well. They do far better than companies who believe it's their purpose just to make money. And that's a, just making money is a goal that really doesn't fire up people to achieve greatness. So we've got lots more that we can accomplish. Your personal passion and desire for fulfilling life is really the catalyst for you to reinvent your personal or your company's direction, regardless of the size of your company. Higher purpose you know, powers the experience of each new day. So sometimes we think of that higher purpose as being the big the big, the, the one big thing. But in reality, it's got more to do with finding the higher purpose in, in each experience you, you've had or are having now. And then you take that, that perspective um, on yourself and your place in the world and you, you plug it into your decisions. It's like plug and play. So asking, you know, why am I here? It opens the mind to growth, to discovery, to what's possible, and to what's waiting to ex be explored. So here's another tweet away. Identify what inspires you to take action, to dissolve barriers between you and what you want your business to do in the world. Can you take your startup or your existing business and turn it into the podium for your personal fulfillment to inspire the engaged contribution? And your company as a global citizen. Now, my own journey in business was pretty confusing and until I discovered I was on what, what is known as the bleeding edge, which is a, another word for innovator. I could see the challenges that business and humanity would confront well ahead of time, which was nice, but completely pointless and useless because no one was really listening. There wasn't a readiness at the time. So while I had an innovator's mindset, uh, I was missing the skill set and the ecosystem, the support that comes from, from having a group of people that are on the same page. So I relied too much on what others thought, and I actually thought that's what I was supposed to be doing, is relying on what other people's, uh, people told me I was supposed to be doing. The result was that I lost big time. I mean, everything that defined my sense of security got stripped down to what was left on the inside, in my heart, in my mind, and in my vision. success went down like the Titanic. You know, retirement savings, plans, investments, a place to live, you name it. it. It all went extinct, like my friend here, the flightless dodo. And like the dodo, without clothing or feathers, I was down to my bones, my core essence, fully exposed and without a place to hide. I had to ask for help. I had to learn how to receive. I had to evolve. I was challenged to really stand up for what I saw ahead on the horizon 
which was hidden behind the fog of dealing with daily concerns. I was being challenged to confront negativity and clean out anything that restricted my role in the world. So the process really confronted my beliefs about how the world worked, and it challenged me to lead myself differently. But in order to do so, I had to take apart some beloved beliefs and set them free. For instance, I believed that financial security, security brought fulfillment. But yet I met many people who are financially secure and desperately in search of meaning, like a real purpose. I believe that success was marked by material possessions, investments, and so forth. And I learned that success is more about remaining true to yourself. You, know, you and I use our beliefs to make sense out of past events in the world, and some help, and some get in the way by limiting what we believe to be possible. So beliefs serve a purpose. The question is, how are your beliefs serving you? Examining fixed or restricted beliefs about yourself or what you believe is realistic rather than what's possible allows you to see and interpret the world with fresh eyes. It was once believed that the world was flat, and then explorers discovered that they didn't fall off the edge, and eventually it became conventional knowledge that the world is round, a globe, a planet. Traditional business decision making has operated from the belief that the world has unlimited resources, easily replaced, and that includes employees. There's been a failure to take into account the impact decisions have on employees, customers, society, and the environment. Communities have been crushed from the impact. This set of beliefs is no longer relevant to today's world. This is a map of the internet, and it's a really uh, great representation of today's business decision-making environment. It's not flat, it's complex, it's highly networked, and it's changing exponentially with each new technological development. But decision-making, therefore, must expand from a narrow focus and a sense of purpose to responsibly and responsibly creating value to society. And that goes far beyond a singular focus on making money. So technological, social, and ecological change. It isn't what you already know that matters. It's knowing what's truly important. It's exploring, discovering, and embracing risk as a growth strategy. It's no longer about conforming, but about leading beneficial change. And all of that calls for a shift from relying on beliefs-based decision-making from beliefs based on the past to really designing the future through the value and benefit you and your company adds to the world, which brings you to values-driven decision-making. So what do you rely on when nothing is certain about the future? What do you use to make decisions about your direction? You anchor your decisions on what's important to you. So making values-driven decisions designs the future on what's important rather than being based on what happened or worked before. So for instance, health is a core value. This is just an example. It could be something else. But health is a core value that's a worthy aim for you, personal health, your company, company-wide health, your employees, their personal well-being, the environment, looking after the inputs that come into the company and, and the outputs, and society. This isn't a poster on the wall. It, it's a deep commitment embedded in the DNA of your decisions. And we've seen, we've got a number of companies globally who, who uh, understand this and are acting accordingly and their results are outstanding. So here's another tweet away. Anchor your decisions on what's important to you, your core values and principles. It's more of a philosophical approach as opposed to a hardcore strategy approach. It's understanding that that you're part of something much bigger. So you can do this at every level. It's quite scalable from personal to company-wide and wider. Some of you have probably had an experience or two during your life that hasn't made a lot of sense. Uh, things in your life maybe didn't turn out the way you expected for better or for worse. Or maybe you've experienced a trauma or a series of traumas. You know, humans are resilient. And when put to the test, have a natural and a deep 
capacity to adapt to what is presented in the moment. When uh, surfer Bethany Hamilton was 13 years old, just 13 years old, a 14-foot tiger shark took a chunk out of her surfboard, probably mistaking her board for a turtle. It, it's been known to happen. Unfortunately, it also bit off her left arm. And you may not be able to see it, but from this picture, she doesn't have a left arm. It's just a bit hidden in her angle. A month later, Bethany was back in the water. And a year later, she won her first national title. Three years later, she turned pro surfer, which was her original goal. Creative resilience is innate to each of you. So when you're faced with adversity, how you react, the decisions you make, either deny your innate creative ability and ability to, to, to bounce forward and grow yourself and your business. So you've got that option. You can either deny it or just develop it and do it. Step into the, to, to your capacity to bounce forward and grow. And I've, I've got a couple of chapters on this topic in Decision Making for Dummies. I'm going to introduce you to the two of the decision-making systems that Daniel Kahneman described in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Some of you may have read that. But there's two very primary ways of making decisions that go with being human. Uh, system one is automatic. You don't think about it. It's, it happens in milliseconds. It's the kind of thing you, you don't even notice in, in the day-to-day. -day. So it's, it's system one is a, a mix of in your intuition, some bias, and a bunch of cognitive processing that operates completely outside of your conscious awareness. A conservative estimate is that over 90% of your decisions are made without conscious thought. It's all over in milliseconds. The other, system two, is slower. It requires your concentration, like tying your shoelaces, or making big financial purchases, where you deliberate, you know, you weigh options, or you analyze. You, you both take the time and have the time to think. So while you give credit to most of us identify with system two, because we're aware of it, your capacity to make decisions on a system one, which is the autopilot, really runs the show. And it's your ally in exponential change. And in Decision Making for Dummies, I've referred to the two as intuitive and rational. So now I'm going to introduce you to these two and I'll give you a closer look. This is system two, it's the one we most know about, but up until now, business decision makers have trusted system two as a hero because, as I say, it's tangible, you, you, you're, you can see and manipulate the data, you're aware of the options, you might even have conversations about risk. You're mentally concentrating on processing information and making the decision. Uh, if you run a company that has staff, medium or large company, uh, or, or anything above 10 people, you're going to have other people that are actively solving problems too. A rational decision making loves matrices, data, analytical tools, and it subscribes to the notion that it's impartial, which is actually absolutely impossible if you apply any interpretation to the information you're looking at, you're, uh, you're using your system one, so, which is fascinating. So logically, we've got a step-by-step approach, but in reality, it, there's a whole lot of other things that are going on that make some de rational decisions look completely irrational. So, and it's also very slow in today's reality. So a lot of fast decisions are being made today, and, and uh, it really demands you to be exceptionally agile, which brings me to system one, which is automatic decision making, often referred to as uh, dis intuitive decision making. So system one is, is a mashup of high-speed cognition, which combines fast data processing you're completely unaware of. It works way faster than your mind, your conscious mind can. It absorbs fast amount of vast amounts of data from the, your environment, including your social environment and your emotional, your, how you're feeling, how other people are feeling. It includes all of that. And along with any factual information that you're aware of. And it, it pro So repeatedly successful entrepreneurs rely on intuitive decision making as their ally because it allows you to see through the surface beneath the facts and figures. It, it's also uh, the reveals the real probabilities for success and, 
and signals when to pivot and change uh, direction if a decision you made took, took you down the wrong path or maybe if the conditions have changed. So intuitive decision making is effective in high pressure, high risk, dynamically changing conditions like fighting fires and executive level decision making. And now, of course, that's turning into, a, that's starting to apply to every decision maker. So decision making in today's environment then calls for a shift toward developing and strengthening system one. And that's not, um, that, that's a challenge because it's developing yourself at the same time you're developing your, your decision making capacities. So it's a real commitment to advancing your self-awareness to gain the advantage of greater accuracy. Now, I'll give you some tools here. Bruce Lipton, uh, doc, cellular biologist Bruce Lipton, Dr. Bruce Lipton, really handed the ability to adjust your perception back into your hands, or rather in your mind. So perceiving is just one way of seeing. But So controlling your perceptions then is guided by learning what you're using to filter and perceive and interpret the situation you're in. Your decisions then are guided by how you see and interpret your environment and what you focus on. So I'm going to give you some skills, some three, three ways uh, or some, some different schools, skills you can use in your context today. The first one is focus. And the question that goes with that is, Focus to your advantage, you really know when to toggle that focus switch on and when to switch it off. So why do I say that? Well, too much focus can result in selective attention where you miss the obvious. And not enough focus and you have more ideas than you can possibly implement. But it's a bit more than that, but I'll explain. But to see the effect of selective attention, uh, just go to YouTube and search for selective attention plus gorilla. I'm sure many of you have seen that great video where people are playing basketball and you're supposed to count the number of passes and I won't say more. So uh, if you haven't seen it, do, do go to watch that because it will give you a really tangible sense of, of what selective attention has the effect of doing. To observe what's going on in the marketplace, wider social trends, workplace dynamics. You have to switch off mentally and that's what defocalizing means. It means just turning that switch off so you're not mentally focusing on solving something. That, that vast processing that's going on inside of you quite naturally, you can let it pop up. Uh, Einstein, for example, discovered the theory of relativity by not focusing on finding the theory of relativity. He was in a train, sub, train at the time. So for you, gardening, showering, sitting in the toilet, they're all good places for those eureka moments, those flashes of insight when you're relaxed and your mind is switched off and something floats up and you go, whoa, I didn't think of that. So it's, it's a, a much wider uh, angle of lens and it's also a, a, um, a, a way that kind of surfaces a whole lot of, of things that you've got inside of you that you're not aware of at all. When it's time to get things done though, You'll need focus and action. And your self-awareness really tells you when to focus and when to switch off and go on vacation or take a break or just get your mind off things so you can allow other ideas, go for a run or a walk in nature. To surface for you. The second thing that's a huge factor is the context, the environment that you're in. Winston Churchill, the former Prime Minister of, of England during World War II said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. It's a very astute observation because uh, research has shown the design of the workplace has a direct effect on the speed of decision making. For example, cubicles slow down decision making because employees can't freely communicate with one another to share the information they need in order to make decisions. Uh, so that slows everything down. And of course, you know, situations where you're in opposite buildings, instant messaging, all those things, all that technology helps. There's apps for that now, of course, so that all helps. But the physical space just is one of the simple ways of facilitating a more effective communication exchange. The emotional and social environment also changes the 
unconscious motivation for your decision. And the, the more Or you dig into to your self knowledge and and your self awareness, the the greater you under the, the more you understand how this works. And I'll just give you some overall questions to reflect on the health of your workplace now. Is authority used to control rather than inspire? Can teams work well together even when they don't agree? Are people happily engaged and do they feel supported? So that's kind of like a short quiz on what's the state of the workplace. But now I'm going to take it into some personal reflection to illustrate the effect of the environment on your decision making. How many of you, uh, well, we can't actually answer this, but, but how many, you know, do you work in a, a business where there's a lot of anger or fear? Fear of failure, not making the quarterly targets, for example. And the question that goes with that is, will you take the risk Because a lot of companies, people get asked, companies ask employees to innovate as long as you don't do anything different or make a mistake. And in that kind of a climate, it's, it's simply not going to happen. So that's going to change your decision about how you contribute in the workplace. And now here's the other side of it. How, who, who, you, who of you work or run? in a business, work in a, sorry, run a business or work in a business where creativity is respected and you have peer support, there's trust. Will you take creative risks? Will you do something different and see what happens? Will you experiment? In the first, you'll unconsciously protect yourself to feel safe. If the, if the workplace doesn't feel like a safe place to take risks, make mistakes, and learn, You'll, you, 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 won't step, you won't contribute, you'll, you'll shut down. In the second scenario, you know you can safely engage your creativity and take risks. You can put your heart into it. And that's the distinction uh, between companies that are simply surviving right now and companies that are able to tap into that deep creative potential that we each have and that for the most part is being left untapped. So I've, I've also included some chapters in the book to explain this further and provide more insight. And right now I just want to give you a little exercise you can do standing up or sitting down, whatever, uh, whatever works for you. It's a practical way to gain flexibility. So if you hold your arms out in front of you and put your thumbs together, looking straight at them right now, they're, they're apart on the screen, but bring them together uh, so that you're staring at your two thumbnails side by side. And pretend that the decision you're making uh, simply focuses on those thumbs. So if you're in business, let's say your thumbs might represent profit, and I'm just going to focus on profit. That's all I'm going to focus on. And you can data that's not being um, incorporated into your decision making. And we see that repeatedly in companies. If you're in a job, your thumbs might represent financial security, and that says, well, financial security is more important than being happy, more important than feeling fulfilled, more important than anything else. If you feel your options are limited, then the thumbs represent one option. Now, slowly, widen your thumbs, keep widening them, spread your arms apart, just kind of do a, you know, a chest stretch, if you will, um, so you can see what's, what you can sense on the edge just past the edges. Now that's what stepping back to see the bigger picture looks like. And it's the most fundamental decision-making skill you have in your decision-making kit today. It's essential because unless you do that, uh, you, can't ha you, you won't see what's, what's coming. You won't have any antenna up. You, you won't be able to see what's coming down the line. And because change is happening fast, you've really got to be attentive these days. So the next tweet away is to step back, you know, see that big picture, uh, widen or shift perspective, you know, re-examine what's important, explore new directions, and, and look inside to identify what's really important to you. So widening perspective allows you to see what's influencing your decision making that you can't currently see. So I'm just going to give you uh, three ways now to hack your decision making in the 21st century. It's, and, and be very clear about it, that 
you know, we've got lots of apps. We've got apps that are out there that can help decision making. But the real technology for rapid fire change is you. Uh, navigating this world of complexity requires a commitment to advancing your self-awareness and the growth of you and your company together. So you're the technology. You're the best technology you have when you look in the window. Number one. Ask, ask those annoying questions that uh, 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 around everything you take for granted. Find out wh why you're doing things. Is there another way to do things? Is there a better way to do things? What are we not looking at? Um, is there something listening? Is there something no one's willing to tell you because you're the boss? And if there isn't, then you're at risk. That's a you want to listen and, and to, to and dig deep. Really ask those questions. So asking is an art form, I have to say. And the question, the whole business of questions, is an art form. You'd be very aware of what kinds of questions you're asking. But if you ask the powerful questions, the, the best questions, you really find out what's going on underneath. And listen especially to what you don't want to hear, but you have to. You need to. You need to know. So it may not be good news. It may not uh, thrill you, but it, it's important to hear. And of course, embedded in that is the need to stay curious, because without that, uh, you won't keep discovering and learning. Second way to hack your decision making is to commit you and your company to achieving a higher environment and society. It's shared. And it has a cascading effect on the company by connecting the passion employees have with what you all care about. So it's really fulfilling. Now, in some instances, it can be as simple as, as it was in the Hewlett Packard studies in the mid-2005 or so, it was our purpose, their purpose in the Hewlett Packard inkjet division was to produce the most effective inkjet cartridge they could possibly imagine for customers. So it can be at that scale, or you can make it a much bigger thing like Novo Nordisk, which I talk about in another program, uh, who are committed to systemic health. So it's, there's, a, there's quite a range in there, and, and it's really just a matter of coming up with what inspires you collectively. And the third way is to step back, look to the edge, and think big. Now, stepping back weekly with your team uh, or yourself, if, you, if, you're, if you're your team, if you're a solo, uh, solopreneur, uh, to really consider what's changing in the larger world, what's changing in the world of your customers, so you can see the world through their eyes. And that would mean going and talking to people, the front staff, or plugging in a better exchange information feedback system so that you can hear what's really going on. Now, ask employees what's in their way. Uh, sometimes it's procedures that block creativity and, and teamwork instead of support it. Uh, There's a great story by Dan Prontifac in the um, Drucker Forum just recently where he talked about uh, these call center employees having to use their smartphones to their, their uh, texting in order to communicate because they weren't allowed to use instant message, so they had to improvise, they had to come up with a workaround. There's just no need to add that layer. Uh, but that's an example of, of thing, you know, rules of if you're not allowed to, to use instant messaging that got in the way of delivering high quality customer service. And explore how you can do things radically differently in a way that really delights your customers, as Steve Denning would say. It's just that capacity to be very customer focused. So the ultimate effect of hacking your decision making is to strengthen your relationships, creating relevance and value for your customers' lives and to society as a whole. And, and why? Well, because you care. You care enough to lead and to, to do things differently. So I'm going to just uh, quickly recap what we've covered, um, what I've covered over the program. We're in a complex, fast decision making environment. You constantly need to be aware of, of to re-examine what you're doing and to apply your creativity and invent new solutions. It's a, a very creative environment and a place where uh, whatever you've taken for granted before, don't now because it, it will put you at risk. Question everything that seems obvious. Purpose drives, oops, sorry. Purpose drives profit, not profit driving purpose. Uh, Unilever pointed that out in a conversation I had with them this spring. Former GP, of, uh, VP of HR and I had a conversation and he, he articulated their mission that way. 
Uh, growth and inspiration, focusing on, on growth rather than fixing on the past, but focusing on growth brings energy to everyone. Uh, fixed beliefs about the past and about the way things work and about everything's under control are exceptionally high risk. It's a switch to values-driven decision-making, which means you really have to know what your values are and what you value and what value you bring. So it's values on every level. It's not soft, woo-woo stuff. This is very hardcore stuff. Uh, we talked about two systems of decision-making, system one and system two, and I've just given you three ways to hack your decisions. So I hope I've given you some tips and insight, and um, I'd like now to introduce you to a program I put together to, to boost your decision-making accuracy. And so, hi, I don't know if you're going to come on for this or... Yeah, sure. So, um, it, I spoke to Donna at length for quite a while, and um, we wanted to try and put something together for everyone, especially coming up to 2015. So, uh, what, we've, what we've decided to do is, if you want to take this to the next level, I know this is some, some high-level uh, training, uh, again, and I know there's a lot of you watching this who are at that level. Um, we put together a program which is um, hacking your decision making to grow with change. So everything that you've listened to today in this um, uh, training webinar, um, Dawn is now doing a, an actual live program for this. So uh, do you want to just take us through, Dawn, what the program um, entails? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's three modules. program, obviously, and um, I want to do a one-on-one -on -one with you at the front end so I can really tailor the material to meet your immediate needs and learn what you're facing and what context you're in, and then I can adapt all of the material to, to really fit. But module one is about boosting your decision-making awareness, and there's a, a number of touchstones that we'll, we'll reach there. Um, both the common, you know, it's really the, the, the things you can watch for, it's how to how to pay attention to your, what you're doing inside, but also what's going on in the environment. There's one simple principle for managing or, or for observing what your culture is doing in your company or your workplace environment. So it is a, there's a bundle of things in there that we'll talk about. Uh, module two, business, as I mentioned, is traditionally decided emotion isn't a part of it, and so consequently they have disengaged employees and uh, high stress-related illness, which is uh, ridiculously costly on every level. And uh, so in module two, we'll really look at how to use to work with change effectively and how to use it for your intuitive decision making, what, just what's involved and, and how to be well through, through really chaotic times. So it, it's using, you know, appro it's a different approach to stress. So, um, and module three is five insights for more accurate decisions. Now I, I, and we could do five ways, what are the ways that you hire? Um, what are the ways you decide a joint venture par a partner? Um, I've written out five different approaches, the, you know, how to work with context and risk and too many or too few choices or how to work, uh, avoid accidentally working against yourself, which a lot of companies do, and then how to use mistakes to strengthen your decision making. So these are all part of this uh, insights thing. Again, I, I'll adapt this to, to fit what I hear from you and, and, um, and take it from there. So in addition to that, um, we'll, each week I'll be giving you a set of skills to go out and practice and play, put, in, put into play. Uh, week one is that's the way that you get rid of the stuff you take for granted and you really start to dig deeper and, and find out more about what's, uh, what, what opportunities are being missed right now. Uh, week two is a stress conversion tool, simple way to make sure you don't impair your decision making by, by um, being overly stressed. And, and there is a, a connection between how you feel and, and, the, um, and your cognitive capacity. And then week three, uh, I'll give you a way that you can use to gain insight. Now the value of that has to do with innovation, uh, insights and, and innovation and or um, mitigating any risks is it's that's the way you do it. It's it's kind of it's central to it. So, so that's the um, that's the bit of the overview. Um, and this is what you get for four weeks of live online training and program and coaching. The one-on-one -on -one at the beginning, as I mentioned, a strategy session. 
the uh, program recordings and the files, and Sohal has very kindly tossed in a signed copy of his book. Right, Sohal? That's correct. <laughs> and so, uh, so here's the, go ahead. That's right. So, very, so, so basically for the first nine people who sign up to this program, which is $297, you get all those bonuses. Now, the retail price normally for this uh, program is $497. And so anyone who comes in after the first nine uh, will pay the full price of $497. So uh, if you're interested in this program, uh, like I said, we've only got nine slots at that discount price. And let me tell you, that discount price um, times that by 10. And that's, what, that's the minimum that uh, Dorna charges for consulting. So the registration link for the program is uh, www.registerforwebinars.com uh, forward slash uh, Dorna webinar. So I'll put that into the, the chat box for you as well. So it's register for webinars com forward slash Dorna webinar so go and check out that link if you're interested in the program like I say we're only gonna have it um, you know for the first nine people at that discount price and after that the price goes up to 497 so if you go to that um, um, order page and it says sorry we sold out of the you know the, the discounted nine it will be after that 497 dollars so um, right now we've got a couple of questions coming in if you've got any questions for Dorna um, please put them in the chat box and I will ask Dawn those questions. So, Dawn, the first question we have here is: um, uh, uh, is Hi, Dawn. What's the simple way of observing, observing, observing what culture is doing in an organization? <laughs> it's a it's a principle. Um, energy flows where attention goes. Okay. So if you're if you're in a, a merger environment, it's not hard to watch. Everybody's wondering are they going to be secure? Are they? What's the scoop? So attend. Their focus of their attention is on: Am I okay? Will I be okay? Uh, it, it's it, it applies. I've watched it uh, that play out in every scale of of organizational dynamic. Wherever people are putting their attention is where all the energy is going. And if it's not where you want it to be then you, you, something needs to happen so that people know they're safe or people know what's going on or there's some way of restoring uh, trust or, or, or supporting, if it's going in a good, great direction, continuing to support that. So I, does that answer the question? Excellent. Okay, the next question is, what's a simple way to identify an organization cultural effect? So some pretty cool questions there. Oh, yeah, no, that's a great one. Um, and let's just say it again, Song, because I, I came up with a couple of images. Sure. I sure What's a simple way to identify an organization cultural effect? Well, the easiest metric uh, is stress-related illness. If there's a high level of stress-related illness or absenteeism, uh, you, you've got a sick organization. I mean, organizations are really organisms. They're, 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 and when they're well, they're like you. Um, when you're well, you perform well. If they're not well, they're not performing well. So the easiest metric is wellness and well-being. Uh, that's a simple one. The disengagement statistics, which are absolutely ridiculously poor, tell us that, that uh, companies are engaging people intellectually, which is easy, but they're not engaging them emotionally. And that's precisely why I laid it out the way I did today, because uh, huge opportunity there and with that goes outstanding performance. So so those are the two simplest ones. It's, it's uh, well-being and, and uh, am I engaged? Am I looking for something else? <laughs> um, and, and of course it often, the other place you'll find it surface in a radical way is if you try to do anything different. Um, so anytime a company asks you to go innovate but what they mean is you know just don't do anything different, uh, you've got a cultural issue there. That's People, they tend to blame the people, but, but it's not about that. It's a systemic, it's a deeper systemic issue. So uh, it has to be solved with everybody working on it together. It's not something you just go in and throw some pixie dust on and hope it'll work. So I hope that helps. Brilliant. And um, if you've got any more questions, uh, please um, uh, submit them in the chat box before we close for the training webinar. 
90% of you are still on the webinar, so um, this always happens. I mean, uh, some of the great, some of the content we've had over the sort of past couple of years really has been really good. You know, we've had some really good individuals sharing some really good insights, and um, most of you stay on right till the end. Um, also, you will get a copy of the checklist. I'll make sure that that gets emailed to uh, those of you guys who have stayed till the end of the webinar. Um, but if you've got any more questions, guys, for Dorna at all, or even for me, if you've got any questions for me you want to ask, um, fire away. Um, if not, then we will close the, uh, the training session. Um, so I'm just going to give it a couple of more seconds if I see any more questions. If not, then we will we'll end up closing the training session. Okay. All right, guys. So well, Thank uh, you for the questions, by the way. They're great questions. Yeah, they're very good questions. It's very interesting that um, I'm really uh, I'm, yeah, I'm really impressed with the level of people that we have on our webinars nowadays. Uh, we we have some really good um, uh, intellectual people, which is pretty cool. Um, so, so Donna, first of all, thank you very much for um, uh, giving us your time, and thank you very much for some great content. Um, there, uh, everyone else who's joined us for the webinar, thank you very much also. And any uh, last words, Donna, that you want to give to people? Gosh, no, I just want to thank you very much for, for coming uh, and joining us today in this car. And part of that just involves us thinking differently about our role in the world and our place in it. So thank you for, for joining me. That's yeah, and thank you. yeah, and thank you once again, Donna. Um, everyone's saying many thanks, Donna. So uh, people have really enjoyed it. Um, I, it was um, for me. It was like because this is pretty high level stuff. Okay, Donna operates on a very high level. So um, uh, I was like, okay, so uh, you know, I hope everyone's going to enjoy it, and they have. Everyone's putting thanks in the chat box. So I'm really, really pleased with that. So Donna, uh, again, thank you very much, and um, I, I look forward. To